Recording by Martin Sullivan. The Gate to Zoran by Hal K. Wells. He sat in a small, half darkened booth, well over in the corner, the man with the strangely glowing blue green eyes. The booth was one of a score that circled the walls of the Morai Hut, a popular nightclub in the San Fernando Valley, some five miles over the hills from Hollywood. It was nearly midnight. Half a dozen couples danced lazily in the central dancing space. Other couples remained tete-a-tete -tete in the secluded booths. In the entire room, only two men were dining alone. One was the slender, gray-haired little man with the weirdly glowing eyes. The other was Blair Gordon, a highly successful young attorney of Los Angeles. Both men had the unmistakable air of waiting for someone. Blair Gordon's college days were not so far distant that he had yet lost any of the splendid physique that had made him an all-star tackle. In any physical combat with the slight-haired grade stranger, Gordon knew that he would be able to break the other in two with one hand. Yet, as he studied the stranger from behind the potted palms that screened his own booth, Gordon was amazed to find himself slowly becoming overcome by an emotion of dread so intense that it verged upon sheer fear. There was something indescribably alien and utterly sinister in that dimly seen figure in the corner booth. The faint, eerie light that glowed in the stranger's deep-set eyes was not the lambent flame seen on the choyant orbs of some night-prowling jungle beast, nor was it the blue-green glow of phosphorescent witch-light that flickers and dances in the night mists above steaming tropical swamps. The stranger's face was as classically perfect in its rugged outline as that of a Roman war god, yet those perfect features seemed utterly lifeless. In the twenty minutes that he had been intently watching the stranger, Gordon would have sworn that the other's face had not moved by so much as the twitch of an eyelash. Then a new couple entered the Moray hut, and Gordon promptly forgot all thought of the puzzling alien figure in the corner. The new arrivals were a vibrantly beautiful blonde girl and a plump, sallow-faced man in his early forties. The girl was Leah Keith, Hollywood's latest screen sensation. The man was Dave Redding, her director. A waiter seated Leah and her escort in a booth directly across the room from that of Gordon. It was a maneuver for which Gordon had tipped lavishly when he first came to the hut. A week ago, Leah Keith's engagement to Blair Gordon had been abruptly ended by a trivial little quarrel that two volatile temperaments had fanned into flames which apparently made reconciliation impossible. A miserably lonely week had finally ended in Gordon's present trip to the Morai hut. He knew that Leah often came there, and he had an overwhelming longing to at least see her again even though his pride forced him to remain unseen. Now, as he stared glumly at Leah through the palms that effectively screened his own booth, Gordon heartily regretted that he had ever come. The sight of Leah's clear, fresh beauty merely made him realize what a fool he had been to let that ridiculous little quarrel come between them. Then, with a sudden, tingling thrill, Gordon realized that he was not the only one in the room who was interested in Leah and her escort. Over in the half-darkened corner booth, the eerie stranger was staring at the girl with an intenseness that made his weird eyes glow like miniature pools of shimmering blue-green fire. Again, Gordon felt that vague impression of dread, as though he were in the presence of something utterly alien to all human experience. Gordon turned his gaze back to Leah, then caught his breath sharply in sudden amaze. The necklace about Leah's throat was beginning to glow with the same uncanny blue-green light that shone in the stranger's eyes. Faint, yet unmistakable, the shimmering radiance pulsed from the necklace in an aura of nameless evil. And with the coming of that aura of weird light on her throat, a strange trance was swiftly sweeping over Leah. She sat there now as rigidly motionless as some exquisite statue of ivory and jet. Gordon stared at her in stark bewilderment. He knew the history of Leah's necklace. It was merely an oddity, nothing more. A freak piece of costume jewelry made from fragments of an Arizona meteorite. Leah had worn the necklace a dozen times before, without any trace of the weird phenomenon that was now occurring. Dancers again thronged the room with the blaring jazz of the orchestra, while Gordon was still trying to force his whirling brain to a decision. He was certain that Leah was in deadly peril of some kind, yet the nature of that peril was too bizarre for his mind to imagine. Then the stranger with the glowing eyes took matters into his own hands. He left his booth and began threading his way through the dancers towards Leah. As he watched the progress of that slight, gray-haired figure, Gordon refused to believe the evidence of his own eyes. The thing was too utterly absurd, yet Gordon was positive that the strong oak floor of the dancing space 
was visibly swaying and creaking beneath the stranger's menacing tread. The stranger paused at Leah's booth, only long enough to utter a brief, low-voiced command. Then Leah, still in the grip of that strange trance, rose obediently from her seat to accompany him. Dave Redding rose angrily to intercept her. The stranger seemed to barely brush the irate director with his fingertips, yet Redding reeled back as though struck by a pile driver. Leah and the stranger started for the door. Redding scrambled to his feet again and hurried after them. It was then that Gordon finally shook off the stupor of utter bewilderment that had held him. Springing from his booth, he rushed after the trio. The dancers on his way delayed Gordon momentarily. Leah and the stranger were already gone when he reached the door. The narrow little entrance hallway to the hut was deserted, save for a figure sprawled there on the floor near the outer door. It was the body of Dave Redding. Gordon shuddered as he glanced briefly down at the huddled figure. A single mighty blow from some unknown weapon had crumpled the director's entire face in, like the shattered shell of a broken egg. Gordon charged on through the outer door, just as a heavy sedan came careening out of the parking lot. He had a flashing glimpse of Leah and the stranger in the front seat of the big car. Gordon raced for his own machine, a powerful low-slung roadster. A single vicious jab at the starting button, and the big motor leapt into roaring life. Gordon shot out from the parking lot under the main boulevard. A hundred yards away, the sedan was fleeing towards Hollywood. Gordon stamped hard on the accelerator. His engine snarled with an unleashed fury of a hundred horsepower. The gap between the two cars swiftly lessened. Then the stranger seemed to become aware for the first time that he was being followed. The next second, the big sedan accelerated with the hurtling speed of a flying bullet. Gordon set his own foot nearly to the floor. The roadster jumped to eighty miles an hour, yet the sedan continued to leave it remorselessly behind. The two cars started up the northern slope of Chahuga Pass, with the sedan nearly two hundred yards ahead and gaining all the time. Gordon wondered briefly if they were to flash down the other side of the pass and on into Hollywood at their present mad speed. Then, at the summit of the pass, the sedan swerved abruptly to the right and fled west along the Mulholland Highway. Gordon's tires screamed as he swerved the roadster in hot pursuit. The dark, winding mountain highway was nearly deserted at that hour of night, save for an occasional automobile that swerved frantically to the side of the road to dodge the roaring onslaught of the racing cars. Gordon and the stranger had the road to themselves. The stranger seemed no longer to be trying to leave his pursuer hopelessly behind. He allowed Gordon to come within a hundred yards of him, but that was as near as Gordon could get, in spite of his roaster's best efforts. Half a dozen times Gordon trod savagely upon his accelerator in a desperate attempt to close the gap, but each time the sedan fled with the swift grace of a scudding phantom. Finally, Gordon had to content himself with merely keeping his distance behind the glowing red tail light of the car ahead. They passed Laurel Canyon, and still the big sedan bored on to the west. Then finally, half a dozen miles beyond Laurel Canyon, the stranger abruptly left the highway and started up a narrow private road to the crest of one of the lonely hills. Gordon slowly gained in the next two miles. When the road ended in a winding gravel driveway into the grounds of what was apparently a private estate, the roadster was scarcely a dozen yards behind. The stranger's features as he stood there stiffly erect in the vivid glare of the roadster's headlights were still as devoid of any expression as ever. The only things that really seemed alive in that mask of a face were the two eyes, glowing, eerie, blue-green fire, like twin entities of an alien evil. Gordon wasted no time in verbal sparring. He motioned briefly to Leah Keith's rigid form in the front seat of the sedan. Miss Keith is returning to Hollywood with me, he said curtly. Will you let her go peacefully, or shall I? He left the question unfinished but his threat was obvious. "'Or shall you do what?' answered the stranger quietly. There was an oddly metallic ring in his low, even tones. His words were so precisely clipped that they suggested some origin more mechanical than human. "'Or shall I take Miss Keith with me by force?' Gordon glared angrily. "'You can try to take the lady by force if you wish.' There was an unmistakable jeering note in the metallic tones. The taunt was the least thing needed to unleash Gordon's volatile temper. He stepped forward and swung a hard left hook for that expressionless mask of a face, but the blow never landed. The stranger dodged with uncanny swiftness. His answering gesture seemed merely the gentlest possible push with an outstretched hand, yet Gordon was sent reeling backward a full dozen steps by the terrific force of that apparently gentle blow. Recovering himself, Gordon grimly returned to the attack. The stranger again flung out one hand in the contemptuous gesture with which one would brush away a troublesome fly, but this time Gordon was more cautious. He neatly dodged the stranger's blow, then swung a vicious right squarely for the adversary's unprotected jaw. 
The blow smashed solidly home with all of Gordon's weight behind it. The stranger's jaw buckled and gave beneath that shattering impact. Then abruptly his entire face crumpled into distorted ruin. Gordon staggered back a step in sheer horror at the gruesome result of his blow. The stranger flung a hand up to his shattered features. When his hand came away again, his whole face came away with it. Gordon had one horror-stricken glimpse of a featureless blob of rubbery, bluish-gray flesh in which fiendish eyes of a blue-green fire blazed in malignant fury. Then the stranger fumbled at his collar, ripping the linen swiftly away. Something lashed out from beneath his throat. A loathsome, snake-like object, slender and forked at the end. For one ghastly moment, as the writhing tentacles swung into line with him, Gordon saw its forked ends glow strange fire, one a vivid blue, the other a sparkling green. Then the world was abruptly blotted out for Blair Gordon. Consciousness returned to Gordon as swiftly and painlessly as it had left him. For a moment he blinked stupidly in a dazed effort to comprehend the incredible scene before him. He was seated in a chair over near the wall of a large room that was flooded with livid red light from a single globe overhead. Beside him sat Leah Keith, also staring with dazed eyes in an effort to comprehend her surroundings. Directly in front of them stood a figure of stark, nightmarish horror. The weirdly glowing eyes identified the figure as that of the stranger at the Morai hut, but there every point of resemblance ceased. Only the cleverest of facial masks and body padding could ever have enabled this monstrosity to pass unnoticed in the world of normal human beings. Now that his disguise was completely stripped away, his slight frame was revealed as a grotesque parody of that of a human being, with arms and legs like pipe stems, a bald oval head that merged with necklace rigidity directly into a heavy-shouldered body that tapered into an almost wasp-like slenderness at the waist. He was naked save for a loincloth made of some metallic fabric. His bluish-gray skin had a dull, oily sheen strangely suggestive of fine-grained, flexible metal. The creature's face was hideously unlike anything human. Beneath the glowing eyes was a small, circular mouth, with a cluster of gill-like appendages on either side of it. Patches of lighter-colored skin on either side of his head seemed to serve as ears. From a point just under the head, where the throat of a human being would have been, dangled the foot-and-a-half-long tentacle, whose forked tip had set Gordon into oblivion. Behind the creature, Gordon was dimly aware of a maze of complicated and utterly unfamiliar apparatus, ranged along the opposite wall, giving the room the appearance of being a laboratory of some kind. Gordon's obvious bewilderment seemed to amuse the bluish-gray monstrosity. "'May I introduce myself?' he asked, with a mocking tone in his metallic voice. "'I am Arlok of Zoran. I am an explorer of space, and more particularly an opener of gates. My home is upon Zoran, which is one of the eleven major planets that circle about the giant blue-white sun that your astronomers call Rigel. I am here to open the gate between your world and mine.' Gordon reached a reassuring hand over to Leah. All memory of their quarrel was obliterated in the face of their present peril. He felt her slender fingers twine firmly around his. The warm contact gave them both new courage. We of Zoran need your planet and intend to take possession of it, Orlok continued. But the vast distance which separates Rigel from your solar system makes it impractical to transport any considerable number of people here in space cars. For though our space cars travel with practically the speed of light, it requires over five hundred and forty years for them to cross that great void. So I was sent, a lone pioneer to your Earth, to do the work necessary here in order to open the gate that will enable Zoran to cross the border in less than a minute of your time. That gate is the one through the fourth dimension, for Zoran and your planet in a four-dimensional universe are almost touching each other, in spite of the great distance separating them in a three-dimensional universe. We of Zoran, being three-dimensional creatures like you Earthlings, cannot even exist in a four-dimensional plane, but we can, by the use of apparatus to open a gate, pass through a thin sector of the fourth dimension and emerge in a far distant part of our three-dimensional universe. The situation of our two worlds, Orlac continued, is somewhat like that of two dots on opposite ends of a long strip of paper that is curved almost into a circle. The two-dimensional beings capable only of realizing and traveling along the two dimensions of the paper itself, those dots may be only a few feet apart. Yet in the third dimension, straight across free space, they might be separated only by a thousandth part of an inch. In order to take that shortcut across the third dimension, the two-dimensional creatures of the paper would have only to transform a small strip of the intervening space 
into a two-dimensional surface like their paper. They could do this, of course, by the use of proper vibration-creating machinery, for all things in a material universe are merely a matter of vibration. We of Zoran plan to cross the barrier of the fourth dimension by creating a narrow strip of vibrations powerful enough to exactly match and nullify those of the fourth dimension itself. The result will be that this narrow strip will temporarily become an area of three dimensions, an area over which we can safely pass from our world to yours. Arlock indicated one of the pieces of apparatus along the opposite wall of the room. It was an intricate arrangement of finely wound coils with wires leading to the scores of needle-like points which constantly shimmered and crackled with tiny blue-white flames. Thick cables ran to a bank of concave reflectors of some gleaming grayish metal. There is the apparatus which will supply the enormous power necessary to nullify the vibrations of the fourth-dimensional barrier, Arlock explained. It is a condenser and adapter of the cosmic force that you call the Milkaean rays. In Zoran, a similar apparatus is already set up and finished, but the gate can only be opened by simultaneous actions from both sides of the barrier. That is why I was sent on my long journey through space to do the necessary work here. I am now nearly finished. A very few hours more will see the final opening of the gate. Then the fighting hordes of Zoran will sweep through the barrier and overcome your planet. When the gate from Zoran to a new planet is first opened, Orlok continued, our scientists always like to have at least one pair of specimens for the new world's inhabitants sent through to them for experimental use. So tonight, while waiting for one of my final castings to cool, I improved the time by making a brief raid upon the place that you call the Morai Hut. The lady here seemed an excellent type of your earthling women, and the meteoric iron in her necklace made a perfect focus for electric hypnosis. Her escort was too inferior a specimen to be of value to me, so I killed him when he attempted to interfere. When you gave chase, I lured you on until I could see whether or not you might be useful. You proved an excellent specimen, so I merely stunned you. Very soon now I shall be ready to send the two of you through the gate to our scientists in Zoran. A cold wave of sheer horror swept over Gordon. It was impossible to doubt the stark and deadly menace promised in the plan of this grim visitor from an alien universe. A menace that loomed not only for Gordon and Leah, but for the teeming millions of a doomed and defenseless world. Let me show you Zoran, Arlok offered. Then you may be better able to understand. He turned his back carelessly upon his two captives, and strode over to the apparatus along the opposite wall. Gordon longed to hurl himself upon the unprotected back of the retreating Zorian. Any attempt of that kind would be suicidal. Arlok's deadly tentacle would strike him down before he was halfway across the room. He searched his surroundings with desperate eyes for anything that might serve as a weapon. Then his pulse quickened with sudden hope. There on a small table near Leah was the familiar bulk of a forty-five caliber revolver, loaded and ready for use. It was included in a miscellaneous collection of other small earthly tools and objects that Arlok had collected for study. There was an excellent chance that Leah might be able to secure the gun unobserved. Gordon pressed her fingers in a swift attempt at signaling, then jerked his head ever so slightly toward the table. A moment later the quick answering pressure of Leah's fingers told him that she had understood his message. From the corner of his eye Gordon saw Leah's other hand begin cautiously groping behind her for the revolver. Then both Gordon and Leah froze into sudden immobility as Arlock faced them again, from beside an apparatus slightly reminiscent of an earthly radio set. Arlock threw a switch and a small bank of tubes glowed pale green. A yard square plate of bluish gray metal on the wall above the apparatus glowed with milky fluorescence. It is easy to penetrate the barrier with light waves, Arlock explained. That is a gate that can readily be opened from either side. It was through it that we first discovered your earth. Arlock threw a rheostat on to more power. The luminous plate cleared swiftly. And there, earthlings, is Zoran, Arlock said proudly. Lee and Gordon gasped in sheer amaze as the glowing plate became a veritable window into another world, a world of utter and alien terror. The livid light of a giant red sun blazed mercilessly down upon a landscape from which every vestige of animal and plant life had apparently been stripped. Naked rocks and barren soil stretched illuminably to the far horizon in a vast monotony of utter desolation. Arlock twirled the knob of the apparatus, and another scene flashed into view. In this scene, Great gleaming squares and cones of metal rose in towering clusters from the starkly barren land. Hordes of creatures like Arlok swarmed in and around the metal buildings. Giant machines whirled countless wheels in strange tasks. From a thousand great needle-like projections in the buildings spurted shimmering sheets of crackling flame, bathing the entire scene in a whirling mist of fiery vapors. Gordon realized dimly that he must be looking into one of the cities of Zoran. 
but every detail of the chaotic whirl of activity was too utterly unfamiliar to carry any real significance to his bewildered brain. He was as hopelessly overwhelmed as an African savage would be if transported suddenly into the heart of Times Square. Arlock again twirled the knob. The scene shifted, apparently to another planet. This world was still alive, with rich verdure and swarming millions of people, strangely like those of Earth. But it was a doomed world. The dread gate of Zoran had already been opened here. Legions of bluish-gray Zoranians were attacking the planet's inhabitants, and the attack of those metallic hosts was irresistible. The slight bodies of the Zoranians seemed as impervious to bullets and missiles as though armor-plated. The frantic defense of the beleaguered people of the doomed planet caused hardly a casualty in the Zoranian ranks. The attack of the Zoranians was horrendously effective. Clouds of dense yellow fog belched from countless projectors in the hands of the bluish-gray hosts, and beneath that deadly miasia, all animal and plant life in the doomed planet was crumbling, dying, and rotting into a liquid slime. Then, even the slime was swiftly obliterated, and the Zoranians were left triumphant upon a world starkly desolate. That was one of the minor planets in the swarm that make up the solar system of the sun that your astronomers call Canopus, Arlock explained. Our first task in conquering a world is to rid it of the unclean surface scum of animal and plant life. When this noxious surface mold is eliminated, the planet is then ready to furnish us sustenance. For we Zoranians live directly upon the metallic elements of the planet itself. Our bodies are of a substance which your scientists have never even dreamed. Deathless, invincible, living metal. Arlock again twirled the control of the apparatus, and the scene was shifted back to the planet of Zoran, this time to the interior of what was apparently a vast laboratory. Here, scores of Zoranian scientists were working upon captives, who were pathetically like human beings of Earth itself, working with lethal gases and deadly liquids, as human scientists might experiment on noxious pests. The details of the scene were so utterly revolting, the tortures that were being inflicted so starkly horrible, that Leah and Gordon sank back in their chairs, sick and shaken. Arlock snapped off a switch, and the green light on the tubes died. That last scene was the laboratory to which I shall send you to presently, he said callously as he stared back across the room toward them. Gordon lurched to his feet, his brain a seething whirl of hate in which all thought of caution was gone as he tensed his muscles to hurl himself upon that grim monstrosity from the bleak and desolate realm of Zoran. Then he felt Leah tugging surreptitiously at his right hand. The next moment the bulk of something cold and hard met his fingers. It was the revolver. Leah had secured it while Arlock was busy with his interdimensional televisor. Arlock was rapidly approaching them. Gordon hoped against hope that the menace of the deadly tentacle might be diverted for a fraction of a second necessary for him to get a crippling shot in. Leah seemed to divine his thought. She suddenly screamed, hysterical, and flung herself on the floor, almost at Arlock's feet. Arlock stopped in obvious wonder and bent over Leah. Gordon took instant advantage of the Zoronians to revert it attention. He whipped the revolver from behind him and fired point-blank at Arlock's unprotected head. The bullet struck squarely, but Arlock was not even staggered. A tiny spot of bluish-gray skin upon his oval skull gleamed faintly for a moment under the bullet's impact. Then the heavy pellet of lead, as thoroughly flattened as though it had struck a triple armor of a battleship, dropped spent and harmless to the floor. Arlock straightened swiftly. For the moment he seemed to have no thought of retaliating with his deadly tentacle. He merely stood there quite still with one thin arm thrown up to guard his glowing eyes. Gordon sent the remainder of the revolver's bullets crashing home as fast as his finger could press the trigger. At that murderously short range, the smashing rain of lead should have dropped a charging gorilla. But for all the effect Gordon's shots had upon the Zeronian, his ammunition might as well have been pellets of paper. Arlock's glossy hide merely glowed momentarily in tiny patches as the bullets struck and flattened harmlessly, and that was all. His last cartridge fired, Gordon flung the empty weapon squarely at the blue monstrosity's hideous face. Arlock made no attempt to dodge. The heavy revolver struck him high on the forehead, then rebounded harmlessly to the floor. Arlock paid no more attention to the blow than a man would to the casual touch of a wind-blown feather. Gordon desperately flung himself forward upon the Zoranian in one last mad effort to overwhelm him. Arlock dodged Gordon's wild blows, then gently swept the Earthman into the embrace of his thin arms. For one helpless moment, Gordon sensed the incredible strength and adamantine hardness of the Zoranian's slender figure, together with an overwhelming impression of colossal weight in that deceptively slight body. Then, Arlock contentiously flung Gordon away from him. As Gordon staggered backward, Arlock's tentacle lashed upward and leveled upon him. His twin's tips glowed brightly again, brilliant green and livid blue. Instantly, every muscle in Gordon's body was paralyzed. He stood there as rigid as a statue, his body completely deadened from the neck down. Beside him stood Leah, 
also frozen motionless in that same weird power. Earthling, you are beginning to try my patience, Arlok snapped. Can you not realize that I am utterly invincible in any combat with you? The living metal of my body weighs over 1,600 pounds as you measure weight. The strength inherent in that metal is sufficient to tear a hundred of your earthmen to shreds, but I do not even have to touch you to vanquish you. The electric content of my bodily structure is so infinitely superior to yours that with this tentacle organ of mine I can instantly short-circuit the feeble currents of your nerve impulses and bring either paralysis or death as I choose. Enough of this, Arlite broke off abruptly. My materials are now ready, and it is time that I finish my work. I shall put you out of my way for a few hours until I am ready to send you through the gate to the laboratories of Zoran. The green and blue fire at the tentacle's tips flamed a dazzling brightness. The paralysis of Gordon's body swept swiftly over his brain. Black oblivion engulfed him. When Gordon again recovered consciousness, he found that he was lying on the floor of what was apparently a narrow hall, near the foot of a stairway. His hands were lashed tightly behind him, and his feet and legs were so firmly pinioned together that he could scarcely move. Beside him lay Leah, also tightly bound. A short distance down the hall was the closed door of Arlok's workroom, recognizable by the thin light of red light gleaming beneath it. Moonlight through a window in the rear of the hall made objects around Gordon fairly clear. He looked at Leah and saw tears glistening on her long lashes. Oh, Blair, I was afraid you'd never wake again, the girl sobbed. I thought that fiend had killed you. Her voice broke hysterically. Steady, darling, Gordon said soothingly. We simply can't give up now, you know. If that monstrosity ever opens that accursed gate of his, our entire world is doomed. There must be some way to stop him. We've got to find that way and try it, even if it seems only one forlorn chance in a million. Gordon shook his head to clear the numbness still lingering from the effect of Arlok's tentacle. The Zeronian seemed unable to produce a paralysis of any great duration with his weird natural weapon. Accordingly, he had been forced to bind his captives like two trussed fowls while he returned to his labors. Lying close together as they were, it was a comparatively easy matter for the two of them to get their bound hands within reach of each other. But after fifteen minutes of vain work, Gordon realized that any attempt at untying the ropes was useless. Arlok's prodigious strength had drawn the knot so tight that no human power could ever loosen them. Then Gordon suddenly thought of one thing in his pockets that might help them. It was a tiny cigarette lighter of the spring trigger type. It was in his vest pocket, completely out of reach of his bound hands. But there was a way out of that difficulty. Gordon and Leah twisted and rolled their bodies like two contortionists until they succeeded in getting into such a position that Leah was able to get her teeth on the cloth of the vest pocket's edge. A moment of desperate tugging, then the fabric gave way. The lighter dropped from the torn pocket to the floor, where Leah retrieved it. Then they twisted their bodies back to back. Leah managed to get the lighter flaming in her bound hands. Gordon groped in an effort to guide the ropes on his wrists over the tiny flickering flame. Then there came the faint welcome odor of smoldering ropes as the lighter's tiny flame bit into the bonds. Gordon bit his lip to suppress a cry of pain as the flame seared into his skin as well. The flame bit deeper into the rope. A single strand snapped. Then another strand gave way. To Gordon, the process seemed endless as the flame scorched rope and flesh alike. A long minute of lancing agony that seemed hours. Then Gordon could stand no more. He tensed his muscles in one mighty, agonizing effort to end the torture of the flame. The weakened rope gave way completely beneath that pain-maddened plunge. Gordon's hands were free. It was an easy matter now to use the lighter to finish freeing himself and Leah. They made their way swiftly back to the window at the rear of the hall. It slid silently upward. A moment later and they were out in the brilliant moonlight. Free. They made their way around at the front of the house. Behind the drawn shades of one of the front rooms, an eerie glow of red light marked the location of Arlok's workroom. They heard the occasional clink of tools inside the room as the Zeronian diligently worked to complete his apparatus. They crept stealthily up to where one of the French windows of Arlok's workroom slung slightly ajar. Through the narrow crevice they could see Arlok's grotesque back as he labored over the complex assembly of the apparatus against the wall. A heavy stone flung through the window would probably wreck that delicate mechanism completely, yet the two watchers knew that such a respite would be only temporary, as long as Arlok remained alive on this planet to build other gates to Zoran. Earth's eventual doom was certain. Complete destruction of Arlok himself was Earth's only hope of salvation. The Zoranian seemed to be nearing the end of his labors. He left the apparatus momentarily and walked over to a workbench where he picked up a slender, rod-like tool. Donning a heavy glove to shield his left hand, he selected a small plate of bluish-gray metal, then pressed a switch in the handle of the tool in his right hand. A blade of blinding white flame, seemingly as solid as a blade of metal, spurted for the length of a foot from the tool's tip. Arlot began cutting the plate with the flame, the blade shearing through the heavy metal as easily as a hot knife shears through butter. 
The sight brought a sudden surge of exultant hope to Gordon. He swiftly drew Leah away from the window, far enough to the side that their low-voiced conversation could not be heard from inside the workroom. Leah, there is our chance, he explained excitedly. That blue fiend is vulnerable, and that flame tool of his is the weapon to reach his vulnerability. Did you notice how careful he was to shield his other hand with a glove before he turned the tool on? He can be hurt by that blade of flame, and probably hurt badly. Leah nodded in quick understanding. If I could lure him out of the room for just a moment, you could slip in through the window and get that flame tool, Blair, she suggested eagerly. That might work, Gordon agreed reluctantly. But Leah, don't run any more risks than you absolutely have to. He picked up a small rock. Here, take this with you. Open the door into the hall and, and attract Arlock's attention by throwing the rock at his precious apparatus. Then, the minute he sees you, try to escape out through the hall again. He'll leave his work to follow you. When he returns to his workroom, I'll be in there waiting for him, and I'll be waiting with a weapon that can stab through even that armor-plated hide of his. They separated, Leah to enter the house, Gordon to return to the window. Arlock was back over in front of his apparatus, fitting into place the piece of metal he had just cut. The flame tool, its switch now turned off, was still on the workbench. Gordon's heart pounded with excitement as he crouched there with his eyes fixed upon the closed hall door. The minutes seemed to drag interminably. Then suddenly, Gordon's muscles tensed. The knob of the hall door had turned ever so slightly. Leah was at her post. The next moment the door was flung open with a violence that sent it slamming back against the wall. The slender figure of Leah stood framed in the opening, her dark eyes blazing as she flung one hand up to hurl her missile. Arlock whirled just as Leah threw the rock straight at the intricate gate-opening apparatus. With the speed of thought, the Zoranian flung his own body over to shield his apparatus. The rock thudded harmlessly against his metallic chest. Then Arlock's tentacle flung out like a striking cobra, its fork tip flaming blue and green fire as it focused upon the open door. But Leah was already gone. Gordon heard her flying footsteps as she raced down the hall. Arlock promptly sped after her in swift pursuit. As Arlock passed through the door into the hall, Gordon flung himself into the room and sped straight for the workbench. He snatched the flame tool up, then darted over to the wall by the door. He was not a second too soon. The heavy tread of Arlock's return was already audible in the hall just outside. Gordon prepared to stake everything upon his one slim chance of disabling that fearful tentacle before Arlock could bring it into action. He pressed the tiny switch on the flame tool's handle just as Arlock came through the door. Arlock, startled by the glare of the flame tool's blazing blade, whirled toward Gordon, but too late. The thin, searing shaft of vivid flame had already struck squarely at the base of the Zoranian's tentacle. A seething spray of hissing sparks marked the place where the flame bit deeply home. Arlock screamed, a ghastly metallic note of anguish like nothing human. The Zoranian's powerful hands clutched at Gordon, but he leapt lithely backward out of their reach. Then Gordon again attacked, the flame tool's shining blade licking in and out like a rapier. The searing flame swept across one of Arlock's arms, and the Zoranian winced. Then the blade stabbed swiftly at Arlock's waist. Arlock half-doubled as he flinched back. Gordon shifted his aim with lightning speed and sent the blade of flame flashing in one accurate, terrible stroke that caught Arlock squarely in the eyes. Again, Arlock screamed in intolerable agony as that tearing flame darkened forever his glowing eyes. In berserker fury, the tortured Zoranian charged blindly towards Gordon. Gordon warily dodged to one side. Arlock, sightless, and with his tentacle crippled, still had enough power in that mighty metallic body of his to tear a hundred earthmen to pieces. Gordon stung Arlock's shoulder with the flame, then desperately leapt to one side, just in time to dodge a flailing blow that would have made pulp of his body had it landed. Arlock went straight wild in his frenzied efforts to come to grips with his unseen adversary. Furniture crashed and splintered to kindling wood beneath his threshing feet. Even the stout walls of the room shivered and cracked as the incredible weight of Arlock's body cammered Gordon circled lightly around the crippled blue monstrosity like a timber wolf circling a wounded moose. He began concentrating his attack upon Arlock's left leg. Half a dozen deep slashes with the searing flame, then suddenly the thin leg crumpled and broke. Arlock crashed helplessly to the floor. Gordon was now able to shift his attack to Arlock's head. Dodging the blindly flailing arms of the Zoranian, he stabbed again and again at that oval-shaped skull. The searing thrusts began to have their effect. Arlock's convulsive movements became slower and weaker. Gordon sent the flame stabbing in a long final thrust in an attempt to pierce through to that alien metal brain. With startling suddenness, the flame burned its way home to some unknown center of life force in the oval skull. There was a brief but appalling gush of bright purple flames from Arlock's eye sockets and mouth. Then his twitching body stiffened, his bluish-gray hide darkened with incredible swiftness into a dull black. 
Arlok was dead. Gordon, sickened at the grisly end to the battle, snapped off the flame tool and turned to search for Leah. He found her already standing in the door, alive and unhurt. I escaped through the window at the end of the hall, she explained. Arlok quit following me as soon as he saw that you two were gone from where he had left his tide. She shuddered as she looked down at the Zoranian's mangled body. I saw most of your fight with him, Blair. It was terrible. Awful. But Blair, we won. Yes, and now we'll make sure of the fruits of our victory, Gordon said grimly. Starting over toward the gate opening apparatus with the flame tool in his hand, a very few minutes' work with the shearing blade of flame reduced the intricate apparatus to a mere tangled pile of twisted metal. Arlok, gate opener of Zoran, was dead, and the gate to that grim planet was now irrevocably closed. Blair, do you feel it too? That eerie feeling of countless eyes still watching us from Zoran? There was frank awe in Leah's half-whispered question. You know Arlok said that they had watched us for centuries from their side of the barrier. I'm sure they're watching us now. Will they send another opener of gates to take up the work where Arlok failed? Gordon took Leah in his arms. I don't know, dear, he admitted gravely. They may send another messenger, but I doubt it. This world of ours has had its warning, and it will heed it. The watchers of Zoran must know that in the 540 years it would take their next messenger to get here, the Earth will have had more than enough time to prepare an adequate defense for even Zoran's menace. I doubt if there will ever again be an attempt made to open the gate of Zoran. End of The Gate to Zoran by Hal K. Wells Recording by Martin Sullivan